Welcome back to the second part of our conversation about how you should pitch to investors together with Dr. Tobias Reichmuth here on Mentory TV. I, I do think that, I mean, now we're not talking about the pitch, but that every founder has to ask him or herself whether after a certain period of time when the company has grown, you are still the best person to manage that company. Yes, I am. Absolutely. You know, I have to drive, whatever. Uh, and some others might say, well, you know what? I'm an entrepreneur. I, I focus on building things um, and it, to grow things once they are functional, maybe others are doing a better job. Yeah. What I've also seen is you may have great startupers, i.e. entrepreneurs, that after a while, once the company has reached a certain dynamic, a certain level, are just not good managers and are not maybe interested in all the nitty gritty of really building a business from the backbone up and not only uh, focused on the product. And there sometimes I find it very hard to either coach the CEO, so coachability in CEOs for me personally also is very important, or the moment to say, okay, I step back, it's still, I'm still owner, I'm still, you know, I still have stewardship of what is happening, but there are better managers around. Have you seen that? Yeah, well, I'm a good example for that. Yeah. Oh, but you're still there. That's good. Good for you. I, I built two partners for uh, 10 years. Yeah. And after 10 years, I, I was looking for a way to hand over the operational management. Now, why did I do that? Uh, two things, I would say. It became more of the same. You know, uh, when you build something, it's super exciting. Everything is new. Um, I think we are now at fund number eight at Susie. And that's great. And fund number eight definitely is different than fund number seven, but it's not so different. Yeah. So it, it, it became a bit more of the same. And I realized that, uh, you know, as a manager there, you need to, the company became larger. It has 60 employees. You know, you need to take care of, don't ask me how many compliance rules and so on. Mm. And you realize that, wow, this really becomes management and less entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and there, for me, it was the same. I said, well, I did that after 10 years. So it might be a good time uh, to see whether somebody can do it even better than me right now. But that's and, great. You're, you're having your ego uh, basically under wraps, which is good. Yeah, but uh, mind you, I mean, uh, I found uh, a good solution with two co-CEOs uh, uh, who are leading the operational day-to-day -day business of the company. Uh, it was not very easy to hand over uh, because at the beginning you think, well, uh, the, I know everything better. I mean, I have done that for 10 years. Uh, oh, I would do this. It is your baby. You're like the parent, of course. You, you, um, you what that. I did then, basically, I, I had a handover period uh, where we all three basically stayed in the office. And then I really took three months off where I said, uh, I do not read my emails. Uh, you know, it's your job now. And also to make it very clear to the team that uh, you have a new guidance now. You know, I, I didn't want to have a call telling me, hey, Tobias, you're still the biggest shareholder. Um, we are not happy what the new co are doing. Can you solve it? No, I don't want it. They have the operational lead, and I can lead via, via the board, uh, the strategic lead, so, so to say. But uh, I, I do think that, I mean, now we're not talking about the pitch, but that every founder has to ask him or herself whether after a certain period of time when the company has grown, you are still the best person to manage that company. Yes, I am. Absolutely. You know, I have to drive, whatever. Uh, and some others might say, well, you know what? I'm an entrepreneur. I, I focus on building things um, and it, to grow things once they are functional. Maybe others are doing a better job. Yeah. yeah. I would also like to talk about people like you and I, investors, and what during the preparation for a pitch, uh, entrepreneurs uh, need to look out for. What would you say is most important? <laughs> well, again, as a tip, um, your product is most likely answering more than one need. Uh, mm -hmm. um, give you an example, uh, you know, if you have a fund like, like uh, companies I uh, build do, a fund can provide different sorts of return. It can provide a cash return. Uh, it can provide a hedge against what is happening in the market. It can provide, in the case of Susie, uh, um, a, a green return, you know, tons of CO2 saved, fighting climate change, yeah? Yep. Um, same, by the way, also goes for Singularity. You know, Singularity is a sustainable fund manager. Uh, innovation helps to solve the biggest problem of humankind. 
So you have more than one argument why somebody should invest. Now, what you can do, of course, is you can't come here and say, well, one, two, three, these are the arguments, buy it. Yeah? Or you first do a bit of research and, and uh, look who I'm talking with. Yep. Um, what is this investor looking for, most likely? Or, and that's what I always did uh, when I was selling funds, or I'm still uh, selling funds, I first listen. Yeah? I listen to the opposite. I don't come in and say, hey, do you want to buy the Singularity Fund? Do you want to buy uh, the crypto fund? Do you want to buy you know, the, the clean energy fund? I rather say, well, you know, how are things going? Uh, and you don't need much, you know, you can say, hey, with this COVID turmoil, tough markets, right? Yeah. And yeah. then the other person will speak up and, and tell you what is tough. And uh, you will hear, you know, in German, you say, but that means where is the problem of the other person? That's the most pressing issue. And if your product can answer that issue, well, focus on this one first before you come with all the other three arguments why you should buy it. I so agree with you. And I think when I sit in pitches, what I really like is when the entrepreneur uh, asks me, okay, so what in my presentation do you want me to actually focus on? You know, he's trying to find out, trying to feel me. And I, I sometimes get the impression that he researched me and that they should do it. Because I also say to many, you know, young entrepreneurs, Choose your investors carefully. And I yes. see it also being on the board and sitting with other investors. We all, at the end of the day, yes, we want to make money, but we all have certain time horizons within which it is realistic for the young company to perform or not. And then you have the, the investor that wants up to three months knocking at the door. Hey, how is it going? Where is my money back? Will I get, you know, no, no. then you have those that just are silent. They go like, oh, whatever. Yes. Almost like the triple F kind of investor. doesn't really care. Let's it, let's it sit. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of quiet. And then you have those that want to facilitate and say, okay, yes, you have my money. But where can I help you is understanding, helps uh, in terms of coaching, guiding, um, facilitating contacts, etc. So there is a whole you know, zoo of different investors out there. Do you find that too? Absolutely. Look, uh, I mean, and, and that's probably a very important advice you bring up here. Uh, choose your investors wisely means try to get in smart money. And I think what many startup entrepreneurs do wrong, and I did that wrong uh, with my first two companies as well, is you are grateful that somebody gives you money. Now, this is wrong. Uh, a, they don't give you money, they invest. Uh, and if you're really convinced in what you're doing, they can be grateful that they can invest with you because you're going to make them rich or richer uh, if things work out. At some, at some point. So, uh, yeah, I mean, look, the point here is, uh, as an entrepreneur, you should be convinced enough that your idea is so good um, that A, you have a realistic valuation. You should not, you know, have others pressing you down too much. As I said before, it should be realistic. Yeah? And secondly, you should ask investors to help you build that company. Uh, I agree. So, you know, of course I can ask my uncle and tell him, hey, would you like to invest 10K in my company? He says, well, yeah, Tobias, I like you. Whatever you do, I trust in you. Here are 10K. Good luck. That is stupid money mm -hmm. uh, Triple uh, family will, friends and fools <laughs> yeah uh, however what i would like to have is somebody who says you know what well, i give you ten thousand or one hundred thousand whatever that is yeah um and by the way here is a list of contacts you should immediately talk to exactly yeah? exactly or telling me and um, by the way uh, you know what i think on your product we could do this this and that yeah and this should be a continuous involvement so uh, what i have seen um is a problem which can arise is if you take in uh, stupid money at the beginning, um, this might become a blocker later on. Yeah. And why is that? Uh, those investors who come in who, let's say, do not understand the industry you are in, uh, they still might be super eager to help at the beginning. And, you know, this help might be uh, what kind of software you should get for your bookkeeping. And, yeah, okay, that's great help. But that's a one-time help. Yeah. yeah. Later on, when you build your company, you want somebody who can open doors for you, who can challenge your product, uh, your strategy, and so on. And, and most likely, those people who are not from your industry cannot. Now, if your company grows, and I have seen this myself, uh, those investors aim to protect their investment. At the beginning, <laughs> they said, hey, it's just 100K. Let's see what the guy does. Now, these 100K, five years down the road, might be worth 15 million. And suddenly you're relevant. 
Now, the problem still is that the investor has not yet become an expert in your industry because he or she just might not be. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, these 50 million, which uh, you know, the value in your company represents now for these investors, are big enough that this investor suddenly starts to take care, wanting a board seat, yeah? um, telling you how it should be done, even though he or she doesn't understand the industry. Why? Because they're afraid something could go wrong with the 15 million. And this really becomes a problem. So uh, what I would say as a, as a startup founder from the beginning on, be very careful of who you select as an investor. If you need to select people who just bring you money, make sure they don't have too many voting rights or just don't give them voting rights. Yeah? Uh, you know, the Google founders, they did it exactly that way. They said, give us money, we have a great idea. No, you don't get voting rights. Trust us. And that's right. You need to get a certain trust. Yeah? I mean, you can have a break clause that you say, if 90% of my shareholders really are unhappy with me, they just can sack me or something like that. But what really can lead to, to problems is if you have too many investors uh, who have a board seat, who want to protect their assets, but do not really understand your industry. Yeah, absolutely. So they're looking really at their own benefits rather than maybe the overall, perhaps being too cautious in a moment when the company really needs to push through and invest a little bit more than potentially well, the balance sheet wants to see. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, yeah. I agree. And, you know, in terms of, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's it. I think the, the advice here clearly is at the beginning, as I said before, try not to raise too much money at a too high valuation and be raised the money from people or, you know, venture capitalists, whatever that is, who can help you in the long term, who understand your industry. Because those people you do want to have. I mean, you, you should have somebody challenging you in your board. You should have somebody who says, well, you know what, might not be the best way how you're handling it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they understand the industry. So uh, I think it's a, it's a very important advice. Absolutely. They understand the industry. They know the people in the industry. They watch as they are in the industry and continue to be. They watch the market developments and might be a lot more uh, aware of what is going on globally, whereas often the companies need to focus on what they're doing there and then on an operational level. And I think that's also a very big benefit, uh, added value to any kind of investor, that they kind of keep their eyes and ears on a bigger spectrum, on a like top-down um, approach for the company and say you know what's happening there are, are you considering this are you doing this um, and uh, you know when, when the team especially the CEO, CEO is open to this kind of collab collaboration what we are also yeah. doing with Falco Capital for example then you actually have a winning long-term sustainable formula to really build a solid business that can scale that can make the money and uh, really be around and, 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 and give people jobs and, uh, and the future. And by the way, it also goes vice versa. So what I have seen uh, with the startup investments I have done is, in some cases, I do understand an industry, and I think I can really add a lot of value as an investor. What I learned, then take a large enough position that it's worth it. Yeah? So I'm facing a problem with a great company, uh, um, my camper, that's Airbnb for camping. Oh, no, I saw their pitch. My camper, weren't there ex-Googlers? In Zoogler, I saw them, I think, pitching. Are okay. there, there ex-Googlers? No, nah, I think they're no. not. Nobody. Okay, but I, I know which company you, you mean. Yes, tell great, me. Great startup, they do it all right. Uh, so, uh, and they presented in, in, in uh, Shark Tank, and I invested. Now, unfortunately, uh, my fellow Lions invested as well, and we Swiss are... Uh, a bit more of a friend to each other. So instead of bidding against each other and telling how bad the other one is, we said, oh, well, let's do it together. We are friends. Yeah. <laughs> Which is nice for the founder because suddenly he has five investors and they all might bring network. Now, what I realized is my investment is kind of so critical to be fully engaged. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes, you hold whatever 2% of a company, that's cool. But how much time do you want to invest of your limited time available? And, and so uh, what I have decided now in the past is if I do want to play an active role as an investor, I want to have 10% of a company at least. Uh, and this means then I do have, you know, I can't take the energy and the time to really say, hey, what can I do more than just the usual? Of course, you always can do a phone call or write an email, but that you really say, hey, I want to sit together with the team um, that you sit there on a Sunday and think, well, what could we do? What, what, what else would be possible or so? Yeah. Yeah, you need to have uh, enough motivation, I think, and well, that's what I got. Again. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. I think, uh, you know, similar to, the, to the, uh, um, the entrepreneur who has to decide, you know, who do I take in as a smart money investor? That should be the lar larger chunk, yeah? And who is just family, friends, and fools? Those should be the small investors who don't have to say much or anything. Yeah? And on the same side as, as the investor, where you really can contribute as a smart money investor, you should aim to have a bigger stake. And then there is a lot of cool investments where you say, you know what, I chip some money in and I hold 0.5% or 1%. I'm a quiet investor. Yeah. You know, send me the reports and call me if you have a question. But that's it. Um, Absolutely. Tobias, we could go on for hours. We are almost out of time. Usually I ask all my uh, conversation partners for three key learnings they want to pass on through Mentory TV to our audience. But we were full of key learnings. But if you have to give young entrepreneurs one key learning, one thing they should always do when they pitch or prepare or even think about only starting a company, what would you say is that? Well, one thing we have indeed not yet talked about, and that I think this is important, Tell everybody what you're doing. Don't be stealth. Uh, don't say, well, sorry, I mean, I have a great idea and a great startup, but you need to sign an NDA. I'm an investor. I don't want to sign an, uh, sign an NDA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you do. I will not copy it. I don't have the time, uh, nor most likely the competence of doing it myself. And that is the case with almost everybody. So uh, my uh, recommendation here to every entrepreneur is if you have an idea, Uh, tell everybody what it is. You will get feedback, constructive feedback. You know, some people might tell you, that's a good idea, but are you aware of this company? They do something similar. By the way, if somebody does something similar, it doesn't mean you should not do it. It just means that most likely this is going to work. Uh, you can do it a bit different in a different market. If the market is growing, you can do exactly the same. The other thing really is um, you get support and you get more support than you would think. I mean, I was amazed, you know, I said, Hey, I'm, I'm going to build Susie partners. We want to invest against climate change. And people I never have seen suddenly said, Hey, Tobias, um, I'm sending you a list with eight investors you should talk to and send them my best regards. So, uh, do, you, do you want anything for that? I said, no, but I think you have a great idea. Do it. Huh? No, very helpful. True. Talk to everybody about what your company is going to do. You will receive support, constructive feedback, and the chance that somebody is copying you is super small. And you might even find interesting co-founders with doing that. Excellent. Tobias, thank you so much for all this wisdom, that experience, and also really giving us uh, some real meat on the bone, be it through Suzy Partners or your explanations with Singularity Group. I think it's absolutely amazing what you're doing, what you've been building. I wish you all the best. I'm observing you. I'm following you. So it's really, really good what you're doing. And yeah, absolutely gold for, for Mentory TV and everybody that's been watching. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And good luck to you. Thank you. And thank you, dear Mentory TV community. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Um, Tobias Reichmuth here on Mentory TV. Much more to come in the next show. So make sure to tune in again. Bye.